Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today, we're going to be talking about an eco renaissance, and we have Marcy Zeroff here talking about her book. Please hold it up. <laughs> eco renaissance, a lifestyle guide for co creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world. What a beautiful cover! Welcome, Thank Marcy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So, tell me a little bit about what eco renaissance means. Yeah, so the eco-renaissance is really built on the idea that we're going through a rebirth of humanity, and it's this awakening that we're all part of a collective ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a renaissance is really driven through creativity and redesign. So the whole premise of the book is through the lens of design, we can change the world. Mm, Okay, and what was your background um, that you thought, I mean... Tell me a little bit about your background and how this all came together, this idea of eco-renaissance. Yeah, so I've actually spent almost three decades driving consumer products um, under this whole new paradigm shift of people, planet, profit, passion, and purpose Mm -hmm. that we can create great products that appeal to people at a visceral level. So in the case of food, that would be taste. In the case of beauty, it would be scent and functionality. In the case of fashion, it would be style. But oh, by the way, it would also be sustainable, you know, ethically made, responsible, organic, fair trade, plant-based. And so the eco-renaissance has kind of a DNA to it, which really Um, The common denominator across all popular culture sectors is creativity, consciousness, collaboration, community, and connection. And those are the pillars that are propelling this, you know, this rebirth. And so my background is I've founded, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I have founded a number of companies over the past three decades, starting with Uh, co-founding what's known today as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Mm -hmm. I then um, opened the first Aveda concept salon with the founder of Aveda. I then coined the term eco-fashion and founded the first sustainable fashion and home brand called Under the Canopy. And today I'm the CEO of a sustainable manufacturer of apparel and home fashion. Um, It's called MetaWare. I also have a brand called Farm to Home, which is the home division. I have a consulting agency called Beyond Brands that has six different verticals that makes all conscious products. And then finally, I have a a plant-based seafood brand that's coming to market in Q1 2019 called Good Catch. Wow. So, wow. (laughs) (laughs) Be careful what you wish for. (laughs) Do you have any time? I don't even know how you have time to even talk to me. Oh, my gosh. That's a ton of different businesses that you started. So, gosh. Tell me a little bit about the market itself. Like, how popular is this idea of eco renaissance? I mean, I, I'm in Seattle, so it's we're probably like one of the places like Colorado, Seattle. <laughs> we're like you know your poster children. But tell me a little bit about how the this is a trend that's catching on. Um, I don't really know. I'm sure you have all the stats about how quickly this trend is growing and and what's causing it to grow. Yeah, so I would say, um, because that's a bunch of different questions, I would say, first of all, the the market is... Um, it's not even about staying ahead anymore. I think it's not. It's about not being left behind. That companies in today's um, world of consumer products recognize that um, if they're not embedding, you know, sustainability, social and environmental responsibility into their products, into their business models, they're going to be out of the game. And what mm-hmm. that's what who's driving that is really the millennials because it's a new day with the internet. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was growing up, we didn't have access to information, so companies could tell you whatever they want to tell you and you had no choice but to believe it. Today you can pull the curtain back and you can unveil the human and environmental impacts of these products. And therefore, transparency is the name of the game. And it's transparency that is the catalyst, the desire for transparency is the catalyst to this shift in the way consumers are thinking about the products they're buying and the way companies are thinking differently about the products that they're making because they know they can't hide these harmful ingredients anymore Mm. because people are going to find out, they're going to talk about it on social media, and it's not going to be good for those brands and those companies, right? So the shift, you know, today, 83% of Americans are buying organic food, at least occasionally. When I started in this movement, you know, we all knew each other, everybody who bought organic products, right? (laughs) Um, You know, today it's 
clearly crossed over into the mainstream when you know right. when you have when you have Costco as the biggest buyer of organic food in the country. This is no longer a niche thing. And similarly, the Natural Marketing Institute has predicted we're going to be looking at about a 1.7 trillion dollar conscious products industry by 2020. Mm. And you know, this is up from only a couple hundred million a decade ago. So wow. you know, this and is, how you can know, you like in the or and you bring up organic and Costco. I I remember so I've been looking at organic like 20 years ago when I was trying to figure out what things should I buy organic, which things I couldn't and just doing this huge analysis. And what was hard is that there are all these labels that are put on things, but they're not necessarily even true. So when you see something as sustainable or organic or whatever, um, is there a group that authenticates what that means or is verifies and guarantees that, in fact, the thing that you think you're buying is truly the thing that you're buying? Yeah. So when you see the USDA organic seal, you know, the circle with the organic that is actually a federally regulated methodology, right? So if you're using that seal, that means you've been third party audited and accredited by, you know, one of the certification bodies, um, whether it's Oregon Tilth or it's Control Union, um, you know, it's uh, EcoCert. I mean, there are a number of accredited agencies and they go in and they certify based on a certain regulations. Mm, so or okay. organ organic is actually a methodology that is uh, something that's authentic and a consumer can trust, unlike the word natural, the word green. Um, now, the FDA does have or the FTC does have the green guides, and that gives you some framework as to, you know, what you can should and shouldn't believe around the marketing of, quote, green products. Mm. But there's a, there is a lot of greenwashing out there, and you do have to be careful. You do have to know the labels to look for, like organic, like fair trade certified. I mean, there are... Oh, so fair trade certified is another one of those things when someone puts that label, it's, it's legit. Correct. That's that means it's yeah. been certified by Fair Trade USA um, at the farm gate, you know. And we have in the textile industry our equivalent of the USDA organic seal is called the GOT seal, the Global Organic Textile Standard, mm -hmm. and it takes into account what is the fiber made of, is it certified organic to that NOP organic, you know, standard that you see on food, but it takes it a step further and it looks at what kind of dyes, finishes and processing went into that, that textile. So that if you see a got seal on a product on an organic textile product, it means it's also been certified through the entire supply chain. Oh, well, I've never even seen that before. I, I so it's called GOT got GOTS. It stands for the Global Organic Textile Standard. It has been adopted and embraced by the USDA as the fiber and textile equivalent to the NOP food seal that most people recognize. We can't use that on a textile product because the 5% allowances only accounts for food type ingredients. So we okay. created a parallel certification, but it is also certified by the same certifiers that are doing food, organic food products. Uh, so if I go to a product in a store, would I, how would I see it? Is it a label? Like I, yes. I've seen fair trade thing. I go to Whole Foods mm -hmm. all the time, so I see a fair trade label, but on a piece of clothes, clothing, I'd see a GOTS label. That's correct. That's right. Oh. If it's a truly certified organic product, product. And so this is where greenwashing can come in, right? So you could have a company that maybe uses a little bit of organic cotton or cotton that they're told is organic, but if it's not certified, it comes down to how do you really know? And then what's worse is there's no guarantee that they haven't, you know, made the product using chlorine bleach, formaldehyde, heavy metals, other toxic chemicals. So don't be fooled by something that says this is an organic t-shirt. If it isn't certified in some way, or you can't pull the curtain back and understand where it was made, how it was made, mm. and, and that the cotton is actually certified organic, um, be careful. So you want to be aware, but you also want to beware. Okay, got it. And so um, I wanted to go into, um, you know, basically Black Friday is happening tomorrow. And, you know, it's the massive consumerism in which we buy things that we don't even know that we want just because... It's on sale. <laughs> and I'm completely guilty of this. So anything to tell us before we start engaging and getting taken up, you're like taken up by the, 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 the swell of Black Friday and now Black Tuesday, I guess, and online Cyber Monday. <laughs> Any thoughts? Right. Yeah, I mean, I would say probably the 
the three things that I would focus on. One would be, you know, we have the power as consumers to vote with our dollars, right? So if you're going to shop, support the brands and companies that are doing well by doing good. So Eileen Fisher, Mara Hoffman, you know, Outer Known, um, Whole Foods, you know, if you're buying food products, um, Thrive Market, um, for clothing, you know, there's a lot of websites uh, like Fashion Kind and Reb and Vert and Shop Ethica and uh, Maison de la Mode. And there's these companies, Kate, that are doing really, um, that are curating, you know, eco fashion, sustainable fashion. Um, the second thing is, is there are also brands and companies that are, I don't want to say they're banning Black Friday, but they're saying that if you buy from them on Black Friday, they're donating all the proceeds to good causes yeah, or they're actually, sense. so they're not offering sale prices, but they're saying you can be a part of something else on a different way of thinking on Black Friday. So you have companies like Everlane or Patagonia, um, who's mm. actually put full page ads in the New York Times saying, you know, don't buy us on Black Friday. Um, you know, <laughs> REI says, go get outside, go outdoors. We're closing on Black Friday. Um, yeah. You know, and, and so you have, you know, companies that are are sending those proceeds to good causes or they're stay, taking a stand on the third tip, which is really bu about buying less. You mm. know, there's this frenzy and mentality, as you suggested before, that we should go out and just spend as much money as we can because everything's on sale. So... That just perpetuates, you know, the the waste and the the impacts of fashion. You know, frankly, um, people don't even know that fashion is actually one of the biggest polluters in the world of air and water pollution. Mm -hmm. And so the the this whole fast fashion movement has really um, become a very destructive force in our environment and you know our for our future generations. So buy less and buy quality over quantity. If you're gonna if you want great sales, look for companies that offer high quality product that has longevity, not disposable fashion that you're gonna get even cheaper. Mm -hmm. That's what you mean by fast fashion. Correct. Okay, it, mean, it. it used to be there were four seasons a year in the fashion industry. Today, there's, you know, 52 seasons a year because, you know, it's that newness and that, you know, quicker, faster, more cheaper mentality. And now people, the brakes are going on and people are going, uh oh, you know, what are the ramifications of, you know, the fact that we've been supporting this movement of fast fashion, you know, especially millennials. And they're now waking up to what those impacts are and they're and they're putting the brakes on. Okay, I'm so old that I didn't even understand that it was 52. I was still at four seasons. <laughs> okay, so so tell me about what's happening. I just didn't even understand this trend. For, so for us who are a little bit George Bush about these things, like, what? Fashion is happening every 52 days? What does that even mean? What are millennials, like, hypnotized into thinking through looking at all these fashion sites that every day you should be wearing something different? Or what does it mean? Or there's a new trend? Or... Well, you know, it, it goes back to the fact that, you know, the Internet has been a very positive catalyst for sustainability because now you can tell the stories of where products come from and what they're made of and how they're made. Right. But it's also um, perpetuated this social media mentality of every time I'm on, you know, in a photo on camera, on screen, I need to be wearing something different. I need to have different looks. Mm. And, it's, you know, and it's sort of this desire um, f for creativity, and it's also manifesting that creativity through the visual experience. I mean, millennials talk, you know, a visual language, right? It's, they're uh, very, it's, it's about quick sound bites, right? Uh, so, so I get, I get it because I was going for, I was buying a, a, a gift for my, um, my sister-in-law and we went to a store that was just this, like a hip store and it had, we were in Seattle, right? So it was, it was those wool hats, you know, those lumber kind of hats. Yep. And I thought, oh, well, that's so cute. I mean, I put this hat on and I, and I thought, well, it looks good if I shush it up and I put it like I'm hanging off of the side of my head, but it doesn't look good otherwise. And the, um, the sales clerk was in the middle and she's like, yeah, it's an Instagram hat. <laughs> it's like not really a hat. And there's That's no crazy. functionality to that. No one would ever wear it because they need to be warm. It's just an Instagram hat. And I thought, Okay, so I think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> just a hat that you buy to wear one or two times on an Instagram photo. And I thought, 
oh my gosh, what what kind of world are we living in? Okay, when I was reading your um, section on clothing, there are a couple chapters that I was a little bit horrified. I thought, we need to tell everyone about this. So clothing, um, what are some things that we need to be aware of? So you talked about some of the brands um, yeah. th- that, that you're talking about, Eileen Fisher, and there's a whole other list. Tell me a little bit about what why those, why those places, what are they doing that, um, and what are they aware of that most consumers, uh, other stores are not aware of, or when we're yeah. going to a store? So I would say there's probably five core um, impact categories. So there's social justice and labor. So first of all, you know, you'd have to be kind of living in the dark to not recognize that when you're buying disposable income, and you're going into a fast fashion retailer, and you can buy a t-shirt for $4.99, you know, and that t-shirt has likely touched anywhere from seven to 10 hands in the supply chain, which is very typical for making a garment. I mean, that's how complex the supply chain is. Who's getting crammed down are not the retailers and their margins. It really comes down to, you know, the people who are growing and sewing the products. So, you know, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Rana Plaza and what happened in Bangladesh in 2013, where a sixth floor garment factory collapsed in a yep. single moment. Yep. 1,133 people lost their lives. Innocent, you know, moms and garment workers that were just going to work and were living and were working in unsafe working conditions, making, you know, product for American brands, cheap mm-hmm brands. Mm-hmm. And, and that created an uproar called the fashion revolution movement worldwide. So mm-hmm. if you go on fashionrevolution.org, you can learn more about the whole concept of labor and, you know, in fair trade USA has actually, uh, over the last handful of years introduced fair trade textile standards. In addition to the fair trade food standard that you see at Starbucks, you know, coffee and, and bananas and other things, because we have to be looking at the working conditions, the child labor issue, as well as the living wage issue for the workers. So that's number one. Number two is... Wait, wait, just to go back. So when you see fair fair, fair trade, that means that actually that organization has actually verified that the the wages and the working conditions are are suitable. And is that right? That's what they're verifying. Okay. That's right. They're right. That's right. And and I was on the um, just small group of people that worked for seven years to write that standard with Fair Trade USA, and I and I have to say it was definitely groundbreaking, um, in the sense that you know I think there's always been ever since the Kathy Lee. Um, uh, Crosby Gifford days, you know, when the whole, when the Nike days with social issues that, um, that people have learned about the child labor issue. They've even learned about the working condition issue, but they haven't stopped to think about the living wage issue. And the fact Mm -hmm. that, you know, the average farmer or, you know, in, in textiles, cotton farmer or garment worker, you know, can barely support their livelihood on, you know, $36 a month. You know, I mean, literally that's the kind of, of labor pricing that some of these workers are, and it is like slave labor. Mm. It's a serious issue. So when you're actually paying someone in Bangladesh a fair wage, what does that mean? Is it like this is a living wage where they can actually support a family of four in Bangladesh? Like what is it? Yeah, living wages are are different for every place in the world. They're determined, you know, the Fair Labor Association is, you know, is very hands-on and looking at kind of what determines depending on that country and what a livelihood would be to support um, what the living wage would be. And, okay. and so, you know, it, it, that's one of the uh, components that has created somewhat of an uproar around fast fashion because, you know, fast fas- fashion is notorious for what's the cheapest, you know, cramming those workers down and forcing them into, you know, conditions that just make no sense. And they're inhumane, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that's one big kind of bucket. The next bucket is about the circular economy. So we have been... Um, creating, buying, and supporting products that are on a linear model. We just keep extracting resources from the earth and we keep, you know, building more and more and more and more cheaper and cheaper. But then where do things end up? They end up in the landfills, right? Over 5% of the world's landfills are textile waste. You know, an average, uh, a consumer in America throws away on average about 68, 70 pounds of clothing a year. Mm. Um, and, and, wow. and this stuff just gets wasted. A lot of it could be recycled and isn't. Um, and so there's definitely the second movement I would say is to, is the zero waste movement and the circular movement, which is really big in the fashion industry right now, 
looking at, you know, the cradle to cradle concept, how do what we take from the earth, we can give back to the earth, how do we design differently, use different kinds of materials, and different kinds of manufacturing methods that are innovative, that are going to help minimize waste in the fashion industry. Mm. Um, the, the third is really um, related to chemicals and the proliferation of chemicals in the fashion industry. Thousands and thousands of toxic chemicals are being used on our garments. Um, and, you know, even on cotton, people think cotton is a natural fiber. But if you pull the curtain back on the cotton industry, you know, cotton is the most heavily sprayed industry in agriculture, mm. right? With, very, with, you know, less than 3% of the world's agriculture, but up to 20% of the most harmful insecticides are used mm. on cotton. Um, almost 10% almost of the most toxic pesticides are used on cotton. And then you start going through the processing of cotton and you'll find, you know, everything from chlorine bleach to all kinds of finishes, um, you know, even things like flame retardants on, you know, mattresses, um, you know, and, and baby clothing. I mean, you know, these finishes that are making things, you know, wrinkle free or, you know, uh, just all these things that are making them more, quote, convenient you know, mm. are, not, are not without, you know, impact. Um, mm. And, and so, what kind of products, so let's say that you think, okay, when I buy this cotton t-shirt, I feel like I like it, feels comfy in my skin, but at what cost? And you're saying there are a whole bunch of costs to the environment as well as chemicals on my skin, perhaps, or chemicals in actually manufacturing our cotton. So what are alternative materials or you know, if I don't want to have a wrinkled, and I was just going through this with my, my husband, where he has 100% cotton shirts, he hates ironing them. So instead of actually having an additive that makes it like, you know, look like it's, it's um, ironed, what are some choices that we could be making that are better? Like, should I be yeah. doing rayon or polyester? Or is that even worse? I don't know. Yeah, well, polyester, that's another whole story, because, right. you know, which we'll get to in a second. But, you know, if you're going to buy cotton, you know, I would use the analogy of milk, right? People have been, we've all grown up thinking milk is a natural. But when you pull the cur curtain back on conventional dairy products, and you look at the steroids and the hormones and the antibiotics, you know, and the things added and the way cows are treated and the inhumane, you know, animal farm factory farms, it's not so natural, right? right? So that's why the organic dairy industry or even the plant-based milk industry has taken off, right? The nut milks and the and the grain milks and because people are recognizing that, whoa, that's just not what I thought it was. And similar right. to similar to cotton. So you pull the curtain back, you see these impacts, social and environmental. So the solution and what something I'm very passionate about is is driving organic cotton, regenerative and organic cotton, because those methodologies are built on sustainable uh, methods of agriculture where we're building soil, we're not destroying and depleting soil. And then ultimately we're creating at the source of our products, you know, healthier plants, healthier fibers that ultimately are better for our skin and our bodies. And the skin is the largest organ in the body and the primary organ for absorption. So it's not just what we put in our bodies that matters, it's what we put on our bodies. Mm. And there are some other sort of plant-based cellulosic fibers that I'm a big fan of, such yeah. as uh, Tencel. Tencel is, mm. is derived from eucalyptus. It's yeah. broken down using a non-toxic, you know, recycled detergent, basically a solvent. And yeah. it's, manu it's manufactured in what we call a closed loop system where all the byproducts are used efficiently. And then, of course, eucalyptus is grown on these managed tree farms where there's no water use or chemical use. So, you know, you do have, um, you know, alternate fibers. There's a lot of innovation in the textile industry going on right now. Um, you know, polyester, the, the, the solution to polyester, because it's, co of course, burning fossil fuels, of course, you know, there's a lot of, of energy use and there's a lot of um, negative impact as a synthetic because synthetics never biodegrade. So the big mm. issue with polyester today, which is kind of something people are really learning about, is every single synthetic garment in the history of mankind that's ever been made has been shedding little microfibers every time those textiles are being washed into our laundries, into our water systems, into our rivers, and into our oceans. Today, there are studies showing as much as 90% of fish are now containing microfibers. 83, oh my God. 83% wow. of our tap water contains microfibers. It is a huge issue today. Wow. And so all synthetics are just shedding these little fibers. Like, and the fish eat them because they think they're food. 
And, you know, mm. their study, studies have shown, you know, a fish eater is getting 11,000 on average, about 11,000 microfibers a year in their diet, right? Plastic, which is a hormone, wow. dis, you know, an endocrine disruptor, right? So right. it's very serious. And, you know, but the solution that people have been talking about over the past few years in terms of polyester is recycled poly, RPET, which is... It has its benefits because it's taking plastic bottles out of landfills and turning them into new polyester textiles, right? By recycling the plastic bottles, breaking them down and turning them into new yarns, which are spun into, or, or spinning them into new yarns, which are knit into new fabrics. The problem with that is it's still polyester. It's still shedding microfibers. Mm. And so we still haven't found that solution. There's a lot, all hands on deck. Everybody's trying to figure it out right now, but it's a big issue. Hmm. Okay, so I either look for cotton with the, the that DOTS, is that right? G-O-T- G-O-T-S tag, or I look at tensile, where I actually see a lot of high performance clothing has that tensile. Um, I haven't really seen anything else. Like everything else out there is like silk or, you know, like it has these mixes of cotton. And, and, and you talked about um, your, th- your second point, you're talking about cotton and, and chemicals, but you're also talking about minimized waste. And I just had my own simple example of I, I went to pull up my zipper, it broke. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to replace the zipper. And I went to all these different places trying to replace my zipper because I thought I'd rather replace my zipper than buy a new pair of jeans because these are perfectly fine. And this is just, I don't know what's going to happen to these pair of jeans if I just give them to Goodwill because who's going to repair this zipper, Right. So I went through all this. I sent, I went to Yelp. I couldn't find anyone. <laughs> Literally no one would help me create, like replace the zipper. So I thought, okay, I guess I'll just buy a new pair of jeans. Like this is stupid, but I didn't. Is there a place to go to like things where I actually have a whole bunch of things where little zippers have broken and I don't know what to do with them. And I feel awful throwing them away. Any ideas on what to, what to do? Because you were talking about all the different ways of minimizing waste. But that's one where it's like a little rip or a tear. I don't know what to do. No one wants, because we have this di- di- disposable kind of world, it, it, the economics don't make sense for me to actually go fix it either. Yeah, fortunately, there are more of these drop boxes that are um, coming to fruition where you can apparel um, – uh, collection boxes and even H and M has them at all of their stores and it doesn't have to be H and M clothing you're putting in there. And then it gets picked up by companies like Ico where they'll, they'll get involved and they'll actually, um, recycle the product. They'll separate it and sort it. They'll take and recreate or repurpose product that needs to go back into the market or sell it to people who will do that. And then the rest of it, they'll break down and they'll use it in upcycling or downcycling. Um, even things like insulation is like old oh, textiles. Oh, perfect. So it would be better instead of sending it to Goodwill, because I never, I'm like, I guess I'll give it to Goodwill, but that seems bad. Um, go over to H&M and give it to them and they'll actually figure out, a, they'll pry it apart and then do something with it. Yeah, H&M wow, doesn't actually do it themselves. They There are companies now that are collecting apparel and there's a big movement towards the recycling of apparel. So it's, um, you know, and, and then, you know, I'm a huge proponent of, um, of renting clothing, of clothing swaps. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's these websites now where you can buy vintage clothing, like the consignment concept where mm-hmm. you can go and buy used designer clothing at significant discounts from what their original costs were. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, that quality product has an ongoing life. And that's mm-hmm. the whole thing is we want to maximize the life of these products because, you know, the other impacts that we didn't talk about really are water and, and energy use and, mm-hmm. You know, the fashion industry contributes up to 10% of the world's carbon impact. Um, We're using that much energy. And water-wise, I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but you can often tell in China what colors the factories are dying by the colors of the rivers. You know, 20% of the world's freshwater pollution is actually coming from textile treatment and dyeing. So, you know, when you look at... Wait, say that again, 20%. 20% of the world's freshwater pollution is wow. coming from textile treatment and dyeing, okay. right? So, wow. you know, it is staggering the impacts in water waste, the water use as well, right? Three trillion cal- gallons of fresh water being used a year just to make, you know, fabric. Um, 
And so the amount of water, the amount of waste, the amount of energy use, the amount of, you know, the, the climate change um, impacts, um, the social justice, you know, situation. I mean, fashion industry is one of the, like I said, one of the most harmful industries in the world. And, you know, there are statistics that, that have even shown it's the second largest polluter in the world next to coal mm. in terms of air and water pollution. You know, wow. it depends how you define, you know, what you categorize in that, you know, is it, are you including agriculture, transportation? Right. Um, but, but it's, it's a big one. So, you okay, know, we wait, have- so the rental was one and then yes. clothing swaps. Can you go back and explain? I've never thought to rent clothes. I mean, I know that I was, you know, I was thinking about tuxedos the other day and I thought how wonderful that men can just have rent a tuxedo, you know, why would you ever buy a tuxedo ever? So what's the rental? And then tell me about what clothing swaps are. Yeah. So I am a huge proponent of renting clothing and you can rent casual all the way up through, you know, literally green carpet or red carpet, uh, couture gowns. Um, I buy from, or I rent from Rent the Runway. Um, I have a monthly account with them and I get to pick new outfits, you know, as, as often as I want. And I send them back and pick new ones and send them back and pick new ones. And I have a monthly, but you don't have to have a monthly. You can do it on a as desired basis. Um, but you know, for, I don't know, $150 a month, I have unlimited clothing and always something different. And I don't, you know, fill my closet. I live in New York city where I have very small closets, but even if I didn't live in New York city, the idea of renting creates, you know, this ongoing life for that garment that that's going to get a lot more wear and a lot more use. Um, and then ultimately, uh, they sell it at the end, you know, when it, when it no longer, you know, meets the quality of, you know, being so what are the, so I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, flabbergasted by this whole rent the runway thing. Is it just for black tie, like formal things no, or anything? No. Anything, casual clothing. I mean, um, and, and, you know, some of it's name brands, some of it's brands you haven't heard of. Um, but you know, what's so great is, you know, you think about when you shop and you buy books on Amazon or something on Amazon and it gives you like all the ratings and it tells you, you see photos and you see what people think of it and the reviews and, and you even get recommendations of, oh, you bought this book, you'll like this book. Well, Rent the Runway does the same thing. I mean, it's so easy and they send it to you in a, in a packaging that, um, kind of like a, a duffel bag, zipped bag that you just send back. It's already prepaid for you. You don't even have to think about it. You just drop it at a UPS box or, you know, uh, the closest, um, you know, shipping oh, that's service fantastic. And plus you get like a whole like renewal of your wardrobe all the time, which Absolutely. is the only reason why I go shopping anyway. So be like, I think I need some up-to-date stuff. Now, is there a less expensive version of Rent the Runway for people who don't have $150 per month to spend? Well, yeah. I mean, you don't have to, again, I, I just happen to have a monthly account, but right. there are, you know, there are other services where, you know, mud jeans, you can, you can rent jeans, keep them as long as you want, return them, get a new pair. Um, so there's a lot of companies and more and more companies are looking at re-commerce, at rentals. You know, it is definitely one of those disruptive business models that's happening oh. in fashion where people are recognizing, again, we all have to be part of the circular economy. We have to keep things alive. And that's why disposable fashion or fast fashion, you know, is start is starting to, you know, move on its way out. And even companies like H&M are making commitments uh, to, I think by 2030, they want to be fully circular and zero waste, meaning they don't want to buy any virgin materials. They want to buy all, you know, uh, they want to recycle garments and be bringing to market all kinds of renewable and recyclable oh, materials. Okay, wait. So I think I, sorry for being so dense. So no. let's say that I, I go over to H&M and I go to that one group that does like tearing apart. So they may actually create some materials that they'll say, oh, I love this piece of fabric. Let's make this shirt into like, you know, a little girl's dress or like whatever. Is that what, is that what recycling? There's all kinds of things that are happening. Everything from literally, you know, mechanical and like these machines that are actually completely deconstructing garments back into the fiber and then turning the fiber. And there's even companies that are, that are sorting the fiber by color. Right. Wow. And that way you don't have to dye again. And then they're wow. spinning, they're spinning yarns into new and then knitting or wo- weaving into new materials where they're using old garments of that fiber. There's even new innovations that are able to separate if you have a blended fiber, a blended garment, like you might have polyester and cotton in one wow. that can actually separate. There's so much good stuff going on in the world of recycling. 
Um, and, and that is whether it's recycled cotton or recycled poly um, or, you know, or w recycled wool. I mean, there's just there it is a movement right now. We've got to stop creating, you know, new garments and virgin garments. But at the same token, when we are, we got to be looking at how can we be a part of the solution versus the problem? I mean, you look at, you know, Albert Einstein, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created them. Mm. So we have to be thinking differently. And this is the underlying premise of eco renaissance that, you know, through redesign, through these innovative models, through thinking differently about, you know, how we're making our products, what they're made of, who's making them, you know, and all of those, you know, kind of source ingredients, it's almost like mm. it's mir it's mirroring this awakening at our own source, at our own light, you know. Mm -hmm. And so so I have in the book, you know, I kind of take people on this journey. And I'm saying it's not hard. It's not complicated. You know, I want to break the stigmas that you have to give up something. You don't have to give up style, quality, fit, color, comfort. You don't even have to give up price. Mm -hmm. You know, and you want to know that it's truly authentic. And that's where transparency or traceability comes in. And we're going to be seeing over the next five years, a lot of blockchain technology embedded into sustainability mm -hmm. so that you can trace product all the way from its source and its roots. Um, but we are going through this rebirth. We are reawakening at our source. And we mm -hmm. want to we want to know, like, what am I putting in and on and around my body, in my life, in my home, on my children? You know, it is this realization that everything we buy, everything we use is an extension of ourselves because energetically it is. Mm -hmm. Everything is just made of energy, including us, right? Right. So these items that are um, pulled apart, recycled, so the <laughs> comment that H&M is actually going to make a commitment to have all recycled yes. fabrics, how do I even know that I'm working with a company that is doing that? So, I mean, it makes me feel really happy that H&M is doing that. So what would that be called? What would I be looking for? I mean, would I go, I know H&M, but what would I be asking? Like, Yeah, I mean, so it's a little bit tricky today because, you know, we are, um, we're bridging worlds today. You know, we're crossing into new, you know, new chapters of the fashion industry. And lots of people are drinking the Kool-Aid in the fashion industry, which is exciting and amazing. And I hopefully they're going to turn that to action. Um, you know, H&M has this sort of mixed reputation, of course, on the one hand, because they've been perpetuating the fast fashion mentality. And, you know, that is something that has been part of the problem, right, is this, you know, proliferation of, of clothing everywhere on all these seasons. There's a lot of, you know, resistance, right? But at the same token, I'm all about meeting people where they are. And they're at the table in every conversation, whether it's how can we use better cotton like organic cotton? How can we make sure that we're using recycled and renewable materials? So their buying power is a driving force for a lot of these innovations. And mm. I have never, never in my wow. career seen so much collaboration going on. You could have H&M, Stella McCartney, Eileen Fisher, Outer Known, Patagonia, and Target all at the table together. Wow. And they all are addressing very different distribution channels, very different price points, very different, you know, consumers, you know, uh, a lot of crossover too. But they're all having the conversations around how do we change, you know, how do we use more preferred, better materials and fibers that are more sustainable, better methods of agriculture, better methods of manufacturing, more ethical manufacturing methods, fair trade, fair labor, better working conditions. So we all have to work together because the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? One plus one equals 11. Right. We're, strong, we're stronger together than we are apart if we share a common goal. And that, you know, what I've done in Eco Renaissance is fashion is actually one spoke in the wheel of this renaissance, this rebirth, you know, the other spoke. So we start with art and then we go into food, which is where people generally start, just like in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our first basic need is food. And so people, when they think about, you know, healthier, better for them, you know, sustainable, they think, okay, that's food. Then you move into, you know, wellness, because the wellness movement is not just about going to a spa anymore. It's about, you know, lifestyle choices and rest and, you know, meditation and yoga and, you know, what kind of um, food products are actually, you know, like sea vegetables, you know, mm -hmm. nurturing um, and, you know, and then we move into beauty products and then we move into fashion and then we move into business because at the end of the day, 
business is probably our greatest force for change, bigger mm. than bigger and stronger than government, which is why when we see what's happening today in the climate change, right? Um, you know, a lot of businesses are stepping up and saying, we're not going to wait for the government to wake up. We are going to take a stand and we are going to keep forging ahead on how we can, you know, be a part of looking at climate change solutions and mitigating, you know, um, climate change through, you know, the sourcing of the materials and the manufacturing of the materials that we're bringing to life and in finished products. Yeah, that's actually very helpful. I want to circle back to, um, I, and I only, I know we only have 10 minutes left. How could that go by so quickly? <laughs> you are forced to be reckoned with. Oh my gosh. We, we need to like clone you and have you like go into like 15 different directions. Right now you have to go in 15 directions by yourself. Okay. I want to talk about beauty products and um, I was kind of shocked when I read this of, of all the different things. And there's so many parts that are part of our beauty chain from like our personal care to our skin regimen to um, makeup. And I want to talk to you a little bit about like high level because you had just said, and I, I don't know if that's even possible. I'm not sure what the right way to like tackle this is. What, what would your advice be since you were the, you know, all the different things. I don't know whether it's like, let's talk about personal care items or talk about high level what would you yeah. suggest? Well, I mean, I think what's important for people to know is that they think they're so protected, you know, by our government. And unfortunately, you know, most of the ingredients going into beauty products, um, cosmetics, personal care items, shampoos are not regulated and they're not FDA approved. And in fact, you know, our country has one of the most lenient of all countries around the world, you know, regulations around beauty products and which is, you know, the, the number of products that are banned in Europe is, is significantly higher than, than what is banned in our country. So, mm. you know, we're putting things on our skin and not thinking about the fact that, you know, we, our skin is the largest organ in our body, as right. I said earlier, right? And our primary organ for absorption. And there is a, an element of lifestyle choices and what we're putting you know, on our skin, we need to be thinking about, you know, how that is affecting, you know, our, the balance of our bodies, right? So, you know, uh, this, this whole idea that toxins and products are actually there to make products work, you know, is just a farce because in actuality, you know, most of the skincare problems that we have are due to imbalances in the body, you know, mm -hmm. and it's and and so when 70 million people are walking around with asthma and allergies and skin conditions, and we're not actually connecting the dots and thinking about, you know, what are we putting on our bodies? You know, it's not just about what we're putting in them. You know, the chemical pr that are in our products. I mean, everything from and I go into depth in my book. So I think you know, at the expense of how our limited time, rather than going into all the details of what things to look out for and why you should look out for them. I mean, everything from cancer causing ingredients to hormone disruptors, um, all kinds of additives and, and agents that are actually toxic. The main ones. I mean, people hear about parabens, you know, that are used uh, very widely in makeup and moisturizers and you know, these are preservatives that are actually linked to, you know, hormonal function and, um, you know, they're, they're shown to have effects on estrogen and, you know, they, they have led to breast cancer. And so this is one little piece, but, you know, formaldehyde is still in products and, you know, you have my, my rule of thumb is if you can, if you can't pronounce it, you probably shouldn't be eating it or using it on your skin right. and, and don't think they're there and they're, they're okay to use because, you know, even things like perfume, you know, and mm -hmm. fragrance, people think, toxic chemicals and, you know, can tr trigger everything from asthma to migraines to, you know, chemical or allergic reactions. Um, and again, going back to the, the magnitude and multitude of chemical sensitivities that we have and the amount of people walking around with, you know, everything from uh, eczema to, you know, psoriasis to rashes to they need to stop and think and, and definitely mm. re refer to things like the environmental working group skin deep is a great, great, great resource. And right. also, um, 
the Think Dirty app is another great resource that you can break down and search by name and look at the toxicity rankings and look at, uh, you okay. know. Because yeah, that's a hard the- thing. So like, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go in and look for a face wash. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Because really when I look at your long, you have a list of, you know, BHA, coal tide, climate, and like a whole bunch of things like I can't even pronounce. Um, so... And there's literally three pages worth of chemicals that are in my beauty products. I had no idea. And, you know, bar like going to the store and like reading every ingredient, which would take a long time, right? <laughs> like to just get like to just get a face wash would be like, oh, my God, there's like an hour of my time just looking at all these face washes. Is there so if I use um, Skin Deep um, or Think Dirty app, are those ones where I could just they just tell me which one to buy that's yeah. good? Or... Yeah, yeah. they rank products. They, they will explain ingredients, um, talk about the toxicity of the ingredients. And I think, you know, an educated consumer is a smart consumer today. And, and you have those resources, so why not use them, you know? Right. You don't have to give anything up. The whole eco-renaissance movement is about no compromise. It's not about giving up what you want. It's about getting more. It's about getting added value. It's about, that's why I say, you know, it's, it's stylish, sexy, and sustainable. It's not, you know, it's not about making fashion and beauty and food sustainable it's about making sustainability fashionable mm-hmm. right because okay. we have to be thinking about it differently we have right. to stop feeding the fact that you are you're being sacrificed or you know there's some kind of deprivation if you're buying things that are eco-friendly that's just right no longer the case. I mean, CVS is lining their shelves with eco-friendly beauty products, you know, like, Amazon. What's, it, what's an eco-friendly? So if I were to go to a drugstore, I'm like, okay, I'm in. You know, there's Burt Bees that I know. And then there's like this other one. I can't pure. even remember. Pure. So pure. there are a couple of them that are in like the organic section. Are yeah. those safe or, or or and if and so that's like uh you know hair wash i mean it seems like shampoos people are doing stuff body washes um facial wash brits like all those things seem there seems to be some type of game like i could go to the 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 drugstore and find those products so there are makeups now that i could actually do that with too yeah, I mean, you know, NCVS is an example. I mean, they've even um, made a commitment to eliminate things like parabens and, and phthalates and, and formaldehyde um, ingredients from their house brands, um, by I think, by 2019. So, oh, wow. you know, they're taking a stand and they're moving the old chemical brands off the shelves to try to bring in more of these eco-friendly products. When I started, you know, in this movement, and my mentor was the founder of Aveda, and he wrote mm-hmm. the foreword to my book. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was actually the last thing he wrote before he passed away. Um, and he was just an incredible icon and, and the, you know, pioneer of this environmental beauty and personal care movement. Um, you know, but, but today, you know, I think people, because of the internet and then transparency, people are saying, wait, why would I buy toxic products if I can buy products that smell great and work well and don't harm me? Mm, Right. Like it's kind of basic logic. Right. But they didn't know the, the probably the single greatest roadblock for that, for why people aren't doing it is they either don't know that it exists. They don't know where to find it. They don't know what to ask and what to look for. They don't know how to read ingredients properly. And that's why I wrote the book is to provide that guidance and that kind of tips and resources and user friendly, you know, information with a lot of great feedback from who I call my Illuminatus, you know, my, <laughs> who are my, my modern day Michelangelo's of the, yeah. and so just so, so for example, I'm going to just give some uh, people a sample of what they can get from your book. So, um, here's some personal cure, uh, care products. So a cure, a Vita, beauty counter, desert essence, Dr. Bronner's, uh, EO, Dr. Hushka, Hush, I don't know how to pronounce Hushka. it. I have, I do yep. have some of the cream though, the rose cream, <laughs> intelligent nutrition, Jerleek, Lotus way, Tarta, Tata Harper. So these are things, and so much like that, you have makeup, uh, Avita, Bite Lipstick, Gabriel, Giovanni Cosmetics, Honest Beauty, and which are the ones that you can find in CVS? Or are they the CVS brands, or is there a brand that you would look at? Yeah, I mean, fortunately today, and and I I'm a big online shopper, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, I don't necessarily go into a CVS, but I could just tell you that. Um, you know, both online in places like Credo Beauty, Detox Beauty, but also, you know, CVS Online, Target Online, um, you know, a lot of these brands like EO, 
right? Which started and was born out of Whole Foods Market. And I and yeah. Susan Black, who's one of my Illuminatists, who I adore, um, is the is the co-founder. You know, they started that was kind of the roots of the brand, a, an authentic organic brand. And today mm. they sell at CVS and they sell at Target and they sell even at Hudson Airport stores. You know, I and, love it. That's and it's, great. And it's amazing because this is where the world is going, right? This eco renaissance is not. Um, you know, it's, it's no longer a choice. It's an imperative. And if you're not part of it, you're out of it. Yeah. And I love it. So just for folks who are interested in getting this now for their friends for a Christmas gift, what a perfect gift, right? It's, totally. uh, it basically has like some list of products so that you don't have to do. It's kind of like the whole foods of, of, of retail. You've done this all for me. And then you actually have interviews with, um, people that have inspired you, who you call the Illuminatus and then education about like what chemicals you should you look for. So if you don't want your chosen list, what are the things that you can educate? educate yourself with and that's in every single chapter for clothing beauty products home uh, wellness things like that thank you for making our job so much easier can you hold up the book before we and tell us about your website if folks want to learn more about you the eco renaissance absolutely so my website is marcyzaroff.com and that's m-a-r-c-i Z-A-R-O-F-F, like Frank. Um, and on my website, I have links to a lot of my brands, um, obviously a link to buy the book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, and on, on Instagram, um, you can follow me at, at Marcy Zaroff or at EcoRenNow, which is the book's uh, Instagram. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, continuing to share the movement. And there's a lot of great interviews. So if people want to dive deeper, there's, you know, I've got all a lot of press and articles and further guidance and information on my website as well. Thank you so much. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support, love and blessings.